أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like to welcome you all back to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad. In our last episode, we spoke about some of the preparations that were made uh, prior to the Battle of Badr. And one of the most uh, interesting events that takes place on the eve of the Battle of Badr is the slumber that overtook the companions of the Prophet, the Muslim army. Now you can imagine the night before the battle, the Muslims now know that they are going to face off against a an army that is three times larger. And it's natural for someone in those circumstances to be filled with anxiety. And one of the great mercies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon the Muslim army, upon the Muslims in Badr, is that he, he put their hearts at rest and drowsiness overtook them. And this, is not, this was not a natural drowsiness. In fact, this was a miracle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alludes to this, as we mentioned uh, in our last episode in Surah Al-An'am, verse 11, إِذْ يُغَشِّيكُمُ النُّعَاسَ أَمَنَةً مِّنْ Allah mentions this as one of His great favors upon the Muslims in Badr, where He says, Remember when He overwhelmed you with drowsiness, giving security from Him? If it was not for this divine intervention, the Muslims would have spent a sleepless night and they would have been completely physically and mentally exhausted for the battle. But that drowsiness overtook them and they were able to have a restful night. And furthermore, the Quran says, وَيُنَزِّلُ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَا أَلِّيُطَهِّرَكُمْ بِهِ Allah also sent down light rain to purify them. For those who, for example, maybe were in a state of janaba, they had sufficient water to purify themselves. وَيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمْ رِدْسَ shaytan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warded off all of those satanic insinuations, you know, those doubts that start to creep into the minds. وَيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمْ رِدْسَ الشَّيْطَانِ وَلِيَرْبِطَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ وَيُثَبِّتَ بِهِ الْأَقْدَامِ And that rain, when it fell, it made the sand, the soil firm. And this is another uh, great favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon the Muslims. You know, they're in a desert and there, there's sand beneath their feet. But that rain, when it fell, it made uh, the soil firm for them to stand on. And on the side of Quraysh's army, it became muddy and their feet were sinking into the mud. So all of this, we see that the Qur'an tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates the ideal circumstances for the Muslims to gain victory over their enemies. Now, of course, the Battle of Badr, as we mentioned, it took place on the 17th of Ramadan, in the second year after the Hijrah. So in the early morning, the Prophet ﷺ, he gathered his companions. And among the things that he says to them is, أَبْصَارَكُمْ Cast down your gaze. And this, is, this was an important instruction that the Prophet gave to them. And this is perhaps a reference to the idea that don't be fixated on the great numbers of your enemies. Because Quraysh is a thousand strong. They are three times larger in number. They have a numerical majority. So the Prophet ﷺ, to keep them from 
becoming intimidated, he says to them, cast down your gaze. Don't look. Cast down your gaze. Don't focus on their numbers. وَلَا تَبْدَأُوهُمْ بِالْقِتَالِ And do not initiate the fighting. The Prophet ﷺ, this was his approach to warfare. The Prophet never wanted to be the one to initiate the battle. He says, don't start, don't shoot an arrow, don't initiate the, the fight. We are here to fight a defensive war. وَلَا تَبْدَأُوهُمْ بِالْقِتَالِ And you see, in the battles of all of the Ma'sumin, Imam Hussein salam says the same, same thing in the Battle of Badr. In the battles that Amir al-Mu'mineen fought during his Khilafah, he always, they always emphasize that we do not want to be the first ones to ignite the, the flame of war. وَلَا تَبْدَأُوهُمْ بِالْقِتَالِ وَلَا يَتَكَلَّمْنَ أَحَدْ The Prophet says, cast down your gaze, do not initiate the fighting, and none of you should speak. Oftentimes when armies are facing off of each other, facing off at each other, typically soldiers start to talk. They start to insult. They start using vulgar language. The Prophet ﷺ reminds his companions that this is a sacred struggle. I don't want you to verbally abuse people. Cast down your gaze. Do not initiate the fighting. And none of you should speak. Because after all, jihad is a form of ibadah. This is not a time where you need to you know, launch attacks, verbal attacks against your enemies. Be firm. Cast down your gaze. Don't initiate the fighting and do not speak. You should be more, you should be attentive. Listen to my commands. Now, we have some historical reports that tell us that after Fajr, Quraysh sent its most experienced scout. At this point, Quraysh still does not know, uh, they still don't know how big the, the Muslim army is. So they send a man by the name of Umayr ibn Wahab al-Jamhi, who was dispatched by them, and he kind of rode around just to get an idea of the, the size of the Prophet's army. So, so he, this was his expertise. He could cast a glance around the, uh, the area and he, can get a, he could get a good estimation of how many fighters there were on the battlefield. So he goes, he observes, he makes some observations and he returns to the camp of Quraysh. And he tells them that Muhammad has about 300 men with him. Of course, this is good news. It's good news that, they, that the Muslims are only a third of their numbers. However, Umayr tells them, you know, he, he looks into the eyes of the Muslims. And he tells Quraysh that, I looked into their eyes. And those young men from Yathrib, they are waiting to inflict death upon you. So he, he comments on the determination of the young Muslims, especially the young men of Yathrib. He says that these men, the Muslims, have nothing except swords, meaning they don't have an arsenal of weaponry. They don't have armor. They don't have spears. They don't have javelins. The only thing that stands between them and death are the swords that they carry. So they have, they understand what is at stake. And he was probably telling them that the most dangerous fighters are the ones who have nothing to lose, are the ones who are desperate. So he says to them, so Umayr, he says, that I don't think that you will be able to kill a single Muslim unless they, they also kill one of our men. Meaning that if you want to kill 300 of them, you have to be willing to suffer, suffer 300 casualties. 
and this is not good news, obviously. It's so best case scenario is that you're victorious, but you lose a third of your army. Now, of course, when Abu when Abu Jahan hears this, he says, "Listen, you're a scout. We sent you for a specific job to give us the number of their fighters. We didn't ask for your advice." So Abu Jahl dismisses him. He says, listen, I don't want to hear anything else from you. Meanwhile, the Prophet ﷺ, of course, being a man of peace, the Prophet ﷺ was not hell-bent on fighting Quraysh. The Prophet ﷺ, he sends an emissary. He sends a messenger to Quraysh. And the message is simple. You know, let us go our way and you go your way. Let's avoid fighting. There is no need for us to fight. When the message reaches Quraysh, when they see that the Prophet ﷺ is not adamant about having a military confrontation, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, of course, is relieved. You know, as we mentioned in our last episode, many senior leaders of Quraysh, in fact, were not interested in fighting. You know, Abu Jahl was probably among the few who was adamant about uh, shedding blood. In any case, Utbah, when he when he sees that the Prophet is is not hell bent on fighting, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, who was of course the the father in law of Abu Sufyan, the father of Hind, he turns to the Quraysh, the Quraysh's army, and he says, "Ya Ma'ashar Quraysh." O Quraysh, أطيعون اليوم وعصون الدهر وارجعوا إلى مكة. He says, O oh Quraysh, listen to me today. If there is a day that I want you to obey me, it's today. Listen to me, just today. And if you want, you can disobey me for the rest of your lives. What does he want to say to them? He says, go back to مكة. وارجعوا إلى مكة. وَاشْرَبُوا الْخُمُورَ وَعَانِقُوا الْحُورِ Go back to Mecca, go drink your wine, embrace your women, enjoy your mistresses, go live your life. There's no need for us to fight. فَإِنَّ مُحَمَّدًا لَهُ إِلْوَ ذِمَّةً you know, After all, Muhammad is a relative. Muhammad is a nephew of yours. So here Utbah ibn Rabi'ah is evoking these Jahili values. Yes, the, the Arabs of the Jahiliyyah were corrupt, but at least they recognized the importance of not killing your own. So he says to them that, you know, there's no need for us to fight. This, is, this goes against our own values. If Muhammad, if Muhammad, if we leave him and he's attacked by others, he got what he deserved. And if Muhammad becomes victorious... You know, after all, he's one of us and we share in his glory. So here you have a senior member of Quraysh's army explicitly saying that we should go back. Now, another man in the ranks of the Quraysh who's also quite prominent also wanted to avoid war. Hakim ibn, Hakim ibn Hizam was one of the, the seniors of of Quraysh, and he was always quite sympathetic towards the Muslims, probably because his son was a Muslim. So you can imagine, Hakim ibn Hazm looks across the battlefield and he sees his own son in the ranks of the Muslims. So obviously, he doesn't want to go to war. So when he sees that Utbah ibn Rabi'ah is not inclined to fight, Hakim goes to Utbah ibn Rabi'ah and Hakim knows that from day one Utbah did not really want to fight this battle. So Hakim approaches him and he tells him, Oh Utbah, we need to, I want you to help me mediate a truce. Let's come up with a diplomatic solution. Why don't you take on the blood money of Al Hadrami? Now, what is Hakim ibn, uh, ibn Hizam speaking about? If you recall, brothers and sisters, when the Prophet ﷺ authorized the, the caravan raids, and 
and we spoke about this a few episodes ago, there was there were a group of six companions who the Prophet sent to observe one of Quraysh's caravans. He did not give them permission to attack it. He just wanted them to collect intelligence. It was a, it was a reconnaissance uh, uh, project. Of course, they took it upon themselves to attack the caravan at, at Nukhayla. And they ended up killing one of the mushrikeen. And they did it also in the, the month of Rajab. And this is why the, uh, that uh, verse was revealed in Surah Al-Baqarah. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially you know, condemns that act. But he also condemns uh, you know, what the Quraysh had done to the Muslims. So the, the individual who was killed in that ambush in the month of Rajab by the companions of the Prophet, by those six companions was Amr ibn al-Hadrami. Now, some of the Quraysh in Badr, they're using that as their battle cry, meaning they're trying to incite their men to fight by shouting that these Muslims, these people who are with Muhammad, they killed Al-Hadrami, they killed one of our own. So we need to take revenge for him. Now, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, he comes forward and he says, listen, if you're, if you're upset, if you're angry over the death of Amr ibn al-Hadrami, I am willing to pay the blood money. And of course, the concept of blood money was accepted in Jahili culture. So Utbah says, I'll pay the blood money. And it was an exorbitant amount of money. It was a large sum of money. Nonetheless, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah is saying, I'm willing to pay it. He's one of the wealthiest men in Mecca. He says, I'll pay the blood money to the families. And you know, just to prevent any further bloodshed. So, really, the the individuals who are serving as the engine for the Quraysh's army, they're using this incident to uh, arouse the to rouse the emotions of uh, Quraysh's army. Now, Abu Jahl is observing, and you could only imagine Abu Jahl is fuming. He's seeing that his men. Their, their resolve is being weakened. He sees that his men, his army is wavering. He sees that many of his, uh, his soldiers are contemplating going back to Mecca. So when Abu Jahl sees this, he approaches the brother of the victim, the brother of, of Amr ibn, uh, ibn al-Hadrami. And he says to him that, shame on you. You're going to accept blood money. You're going to take gold instead of avenging the murder of your brother, you're, you're selling his memory cheap for some gold. You're going to turn a blind eye against those who killed your brother. So he's trying to incite the brother to fight. And of course, Abu Jahl, he knows, he knows how to hit below the belt. Abu Jahl also calls Utba a coward and perhaps the worst thing that you can say to the, the Arabs at this time is to question their bravery to question their courage to question their manliness so Abu Jahl he says oh Utba I see that you don't want to fight I see that you're trying to persuade Everyone to go back to Mecca. Ya Utba, Navarta ila suyuf bani Abdul Muttalib wa jabunt. O Utba, it seems that you saw the swords of the sons of Abdul Muttalib and you became cowardly, you became weak. The narration says, Fanezala Utba an Jamale. When Utba heard, Abu Jahl calling him a coward in front of everybody publicly. He came down, the narration says he came down from his camel وَحَمَلَ عَلَىٰ أَبِي جَهْلٍ وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ فَرَسِ That Utba comes down from his camel in a state of rage and he starts to physically attack Abu Jahl. He essentially starts beating up Abu Jahl and pulling him by his hair. 
And he says to him, he holds him by his head, and he says, "Amithli yajbun? You think someone like me is a coward? Wasataalamu Quraysh al-yom, ayun al al alam wa ajban." Today, Quraysh will see, well, they will know who is vicious, who is aggressive, and who is cowardly. So you see, brothers and sisters, in a moment. Utba succumbs to the peer pressure. He succumbs to the peer pressure. He was about to turn away. And who knows, brothers and sisters, maybe Allah would have given, given him the tawfiq of hidayah. Maybe Allah would have guided him for choosing not to fight the messenger of God. But because of a comment by Abu Jahl, because of his ego, he makes the most destructive decision of his life. That he chooses to stay. And not only that, he tries to show off. Abu Jahl calls him a coward. Now he wants to prove to Abu Jahl that he's not a coward. Who's Abu Jahl? Who cares what Abu Jahl says? But this, this is the nature of some people. They want to impress others. So he comes forward and in fact, he is the fir- among the first to get killed in the Battle of Badr. And he loses his Akhirah because of a comment by Abu Jahl. Now, of course, we'll speak about the, the Mubarazah that, that takes place, but before that, it's, it's noteworthy to mention that before the battle began, the Prophet ﷺ told his army that there are a couple of people who they should not kill. Number one is Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet. And the second was a man by the name of Abu al-Bakhtari ibn Hisham. And this individual, this man, was in, played an instrumental role in suspending the boycott against Bani Hashim in Mecca. So the Prophet he says that these individuals should be protected do not kill these men. And this shows you, brothers and sisters, that the Prophet ﷺ understood that not everyone who stands against Islam and the Muslims are the same, is the same. Not everyone is like Abu Jahl. There are some people who are being coerced to participate. There are some people who, who are brought against their will. There are some people who might have been brainwashed. So it's important for us, even when we look at those who are hostile towards Islam, not all of them are the same. Not all, of, not all people who stand against Islam and Muslims are like Abu Jahl. Some of them are victims of propaganda. Others are coerced. They're there because of social pressures. So the Prophet ﷺ, he has this nuanced approach, even with his enemies. He knows that there are... There are enemies who are, who are like Abu Jahl, who are die-hard enemies, whose hearts are sealed. And there are people who have potential to be guided. Now, interestingly, the first person to die in the Battle of Badr was a man from the clan of Abu Jahl. And he actually didn't die... Uh, you know, during the actual battle. This man is Al-Aswad, Ibn Abd Al-Aswad Al-Makhzumi. So the clan of Abu Jahl is Banu Makhzum. And this man, it seems that this took place on the eve of the battle or the morning of the battle. So when Quraysh came to the battlefield, they saw that the Muslims had control over the water supply. So this man tries to sneak behind the the Muslim army to access the wells. And of course, Quraysh, you know, they had plenty of supplies as is. But none the case, it was probably his way of trying to cut off water from the Muslims. So he attempts to sneak into the side where there were the wells, but Hamza, he captures him, he sees him, and Hamza strikes him, and he cuts his leg off, and... He ends up dying before he reaches the water. So, and the, so this incident took place uh, probably in the early morning hours uh, before.
the battle. So this was actually the first casualty on the day of Badr. So Utbah comes forward. After Abu Jahl calls him a coward, the narration says, وَتَقَدَّمَ عُتْبَةً وَأَخُوهُ شَيْبَةً وَابْنُهُ الْوَلِيدِ Three men come forward. Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, his brother, the brother of Utbah, Shayba, and his son, and the son of Utbah, Al-Walid, Al-Walid ibn Utbah. And they come forward to engage in what is called in what is called Mubaraza. You know, in ancient times, the way that battles would take place is that at the begin, beginning of the battle, both sides would send their top tier fighters. And there would be face-to-face combat between a few of them. And then the battle would begin. Then the two armies would clash. And this Mubaraza was done because it was an intimidation tactic. Meaning that an army would showcase, would present their most fierce fighters to instill fear in the rest. And one of the benefits, if you are able to win that Mubaraza, is that you, if you are able to kill the top-tier fighters, it demoralizes the others. And if you're on the winning side, if your side of the army, if your army is the army that, that, that won during the Mubaraza, it would give you a morale boost. Now, typically, the leaders of both sides would not engage in the Mubaraza, but definitely the first-tier Fighters would do so. So Utbah, Shayba, and Al Walid, of course, these are some of the most famous warriors among Quraysh. They are what we would call top tier fighters. They come forward and Utbah shouts. So you can imagine several hundred feet, you know, a couple hundred feet separating the, the two armies. And Utbah shouts towards the, the camp of the Prophet. Wanada, so Utba shouts out, Wanada, Ya Muhammad, O Muhammad, Ukhruj ilayna akfa'ana min Quraysh. O Muhammad, send us our equals from Quraysh. Our equals meaning, send us your top fighters. Send us tier one fighters. فَبَرَزَ إِلَيْهِ ثَلَاثَةُ نَفَرٍ مِّنَ الْأَنصَارِ مِنْ, من بَنِي عَفْرَى Now some of the, the younger uh, men in the army of the Prophet, they were very anxious to fight. So three men, when they heard Utbah shouting to the Prophet to send their equals, three young men from the Ansar, they come forward. And the historians mention that they're from the, the clan of Banu Afra, and their names are mentioned by historians. Auf ibn al-Harith, Mu'awad ibn al-Harith, and Abdullah ibn Rawaha. Now when these men come forward, Utbah of course, because of the distance, he can't see their faces. He doesn't know who they are. فَقَالَ Utba مَنْ أَنْتُمْ He says, who are you? He sees three men, three young men come forward. He says, "Who are you?" In Tesibu Lina Arifakum, tell us your lineage, so we may know who you are. So you see the importance of lineage in the culture of the Arabs. You know, if they want to know who you are, they all, they want to know who your forefathers. Are. Do you come from a line of warriors and fighters? Because Yes, military prowess is part skill, but it's also part genetics. You know, some people just have it in them. They have this natural ferociousness and courage in the battlefield. So yes, sword fighting can be learned. Some of the techniques in battle can be learned, but there is a large element of it that is genetic. So they, so Utba says, in Tesibu, who is your lineage? Who are your forefathers? So we know. So they say, Fakalu Nahnu Banu Afra. We are Banu Afra. 
Ansaru Rasul Ansaru Allah wa Ansaru Rasulillah. We are Banu Afra, we are the helpers of God, and we are the helpers of His Messenger. Of course, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, these are people that, that they know genealogy. They know which clans are famous for their valor and their courage. Utba says, Irji'u, go back. Lesna iyakum nurid. We don't want to fight someone like you. Innama nuridul akfa min Quraysh. We want to fight with people who can match up against us. People who are equal to us in fighting skill, in bravery, in courage. We want to fight our equals from Quraysh. When the Prophet hears this, the Prophet realizes that okay, he has to send, you know, as we say, he has to pull out the big guns. ثُمَّ نَظَرَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وآله إلى عمه عبيد ابن الحارث ابن المطلب وكان له سبعون سنة The Prophet, he looked towards his uncle, not his literal uncle, but one of the elders of his family, عبيد ابن الحارث ابن مطلب who was 70 years old. And the Prophet, of course, the way that Mubaraza would work is that they would match people who are who were close in age. So Utbah ibn Rabi'ah is an old man. You know, he's probably in his 60s. Shayba is a little bit younger. And Al-Walid is a youth. He's in his 20s or his 30s. So the Prophet needs to select a top-tier fighter to fight an older man. So he chooses Ubaidah ibn Al-Harith, who's 70 years old. And Ubaidah, his grandfather is Muttalib, who is the uncle of Abdul Muttalib. So Ubaidah was the Prophet's father's second cousin. So he's a relative of the Prophet. So he's not from Banu Hashim, but he's Qurayshi. He's Qurayshi. So the Prophet says, قُمْ يَا عُبَيْدَةِ Ubaidah, stand up. فَقَامَ بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ بِالسَّيْفِ So he stands up, he unsheathes his sword, and he's ready to fight. So who's the next one that the Prophet selects? ثُمَّ نَظَرَ إِلَىٰ حَمْزَ إِبْنْ عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبِ The Prophet then glances at Hamza. So imagine the Muslims are standing in rows. The Prophet now is picking out his best fighters. He looks at Hamza. So he needs someone middle-aged now to fight against Shayba. So Ubaidah has been matched up with Utbah. He needs someone middle-aged, Hamza ibn Abd al The Prophet says, قُمْ يَا عَمْ Oh, my uncle stand. Immediately, Hamza stands. This is his nephew. But Hamza obeys the Prophet as if the Prophet is his elder. قُمْ يَا عَمْ Hamza stands. He's ready. ثُمَّ نَظَرَ إِلَىٰ أَمِيرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Now the Prophet needs a younger fighter who can match Walid. Of course, there is none other than Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, who is in his early 20s. He's about 23 years old on the day of Badr. ثُمَّ نَظَرَ إِلَىٰ أَمِيرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فَقَالَ لَهُ قُمْ يَا عَلِي Oh, Ali, stand. وَكَانَ أَصْغَرُهُمْ Ali was the youngest of them. He was the youngest of the group. So he was even younger uh, perhaps even then, uh, Al-Walid. ثُمَّ قَالَ يَا عُبَيْدَ عَلَيْكَ بِعُتْبَ So then the Prophet assigns each of them to a fighter. Ubaid is, is, is told that you're going to fight Utbah, Hamza is told you're going to fight Shayba, and Ali is told you're going to fight Walid. فَمَرُّوا حَتَّى انْتَهُوا إِلَى الْقَوْمِ So they come forward. So you can imagine the Muslim army, three fighters come forward. Now again, because of the distance, because of the gap between the two armies, Utbah could not make out their faces. Utbah could not see who are these three new fighters that have come, that have come forward, who are being sent by the Prophet. So again, he asks, he shouts out, Men entum, who are you? Intesibu li-na'rifakum, tell us your lineage, so we may know who you are. So, Ubaida begins. فَقَالَ عُبَيْدَ أَنَا عُبَيْدَ إِبْنِ الْحَارِثِ إِبْنِ الْمُطَّلِبِ I am Ubaida, the son of Al-Harith, the son of Muttalib. Utbah, when he hears this, he says, كُفْوٌ كريم. This, You are a noble equal to us. So Utbah is satisfied. So this shows you that 
Utbah knows that Ubaidah ibn al-Harith is a fighter. He's a great warrior. So he says, challenge accepted. Utbah then asks, who are the two who are with you? Ubaidah says, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib and Ali ibn Abi Talib. The two who are with me are these two. فَقَالَ عُتْبَ كُفْوَانْ كَرِيمَانْ Those two are also noble equals. لَعَنَ اللَّهُ مَنْ أَوْقَفَنَا وَإِيَّاكُمْ هَذَا الْمَوْقِفِ So Utba, again he gives us another hint that he doesn't want to do this. So he says, may God curse the one who made us stand against each other. Probably a reference to Abu Jahl and the Prophet. Allahu alam. There's a very interesting conversation that takes place between Hamza and Shayba. Shayba, as, as, as I've mentioned, is the younger brother of Utba. So the six men, they come close to each other. They're now standing a few meters away. They're about to engage in face-to-face combat. So Ali is facing Al-Walid. Ubaidah is facing Utba. And Hamza is facing Shayba. وَوَقَفَ حَمْزَ بِإِزَاءِ شَيْبَ فَقَالَ لَهُ شَيْبَ Shayba, he asks Hamza, Men and who are you? Perhaps he, you know, Shayba was trying to get into Hamza's head. He was trying to, you know, belittle him. Meaning like, who, who do you think you are? Hamza, he says, Who am I? أنا حمزة ابن ابن عبد المطلب. I am حمزة, the son of عبد المطلب, أسد الله وأسد رسوله. I am the lion of God, and I am the lion of His messenger. شيبة, he says that you're the lion of God. He says to him that today you have encountered the lion of the jungle. So Shayba is referring to himself. He says, you're the lion of, I'm the lion of the jungle. And let's see how you fight, O lion of God. Now, as you know, brothers and sisters, Ubaida, Hamza, and Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, they are all able to kill their opponents. Of course, Ubaida ibn al-Harith is fatally wounded, and Hamza and Ali, they come to his rescue and they finish off Utbah. And because Ubaidah is fatally wounded, Hamza and Ali ibn Abi Talib, they carry Ubaidah off of the battlefield. And they take him to the Prophet. So, the narration says, when they brought the body of Ubaidah, and he was still alive, he was bleeding heavily, and they knew that they could not stop the bleeding. He was, he was mortally wounded, essentially. فَنَظَرَ إِلَيْهِ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَاسْتَعْبَرْ The narration says, when the Prophet saw that Ubaidah, his beloved relative, was fatally wounded, استعبر, meaning the Prophet's eyes filled with tears. فَقَالَ عُبَيْدَ Ubaidah said to the Prophet, يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ بِأَبِي أَنْتَ وَأُمِّي أَلَسْتُ شَهِيدًا Ubaidah says, Ya Rasulullah, may my mother and my father be sacrificed for you. This was an expression of great devotion. He asked the Prophet that, am I, am I going to be a martyr? Am I considered a martyr? Look at the, the faith of this man. He's in his last moments and he wants confirmation from the Prophet that he will meet Allah as a shaheed. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, Bala, anta awwalu shaheedin min ahli bayti. Yes, indeed you are a martyr. In fact, you are the first martyr from my family, from among my relatives. There's an interesting narration here. It's, this is mentioned in both Sunni and Shia sources that Iblis participated in the Battle of Badr. 
Waja, the narration says, Waja Iblis ila Quraysh fi surati suraq ibn Malik faqala lahum itfa'u ilayya rayatakum fadafa'uha ilay. So narrations say that Iblis, la'anahullah, he took the form of a man by the name of Suraq ibn Malik who was on Quraysh's side. And he requested to hold Quraysh's standard. Now, I don't know what the deal is with this guy, but Iblis decided to take on uh, his form. Now, of course, if you're a satanic person, you know, this is possible. He's not, Iblis is not going to take the form of awliyaullah or take the form of prophets, but it seems that, you know, he's able to take uh, the human form of people who he wishes who have inclinations towards evil. In any case, he takes the form of this man. So the one who was holding the flag of Quraysh on the day of Badr, even though if you look at him, it's Suraq ibn Malik, but it, it is actually Iblis in the form of this man. Now the Prophet ﷺ, of course, again, he emphasizes to his men the need to maintain discipline. Battles can only be won if the fighters are disciplined. And he told them not to unsheathe their swords until he gives the command. And of course, the Prophet ﷺ, again, throughout the battle, he was praying on the eve of Badr, on the day of Badr, he's praying and he says, O Lord, if this band of men is destroyed, you will no longer be worshipped. But if you wish not to be worshipped, then you will not be worshipped. Now, the Prophet ﷺ, of course, because of the weight of the responsibility, the Prophet ﷺ was, was in the middle of his, the, the army. He's giving orders, trying to keep everybody in line. And revelation descends upon the Prophet during the battle of Badr. Now, of course, when revelation descends upon Rasulullah when he is awake, because we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also communicates to his prophets uh, sometimes through dreams, the Prophet ﷺ, he feels faint for a moment and then he tells his men. Some of them see that the Prophet looks like he's about to collapse. But he tells them that Jibra'il has arrived with a thousand angels to aid them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in the Quran. So the Muslims in Badr were supported by a thousand mala'ika, a thousand angels. So even though Quraysh, if you look at it just from a, through a material lens, through a dunyawi lens, yes, they have a majority. They have three times the numbers of the Muslims. But if you were to see Alamul Ghaib, if people were to see the world of the unseen, they would say, No, there are three there are three hundred and thirteen Muslims, but there are a thousand angels. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Id Tastaghithuna Rabbakum. Remember when you asked help of your Lord, فَاسْتَجَابَ لَكُمْ أَنِّي مُمِدُّكُمْ بِأَلْفٍ مِّنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ مُرْدِفِينَ Remember when you asked help of your Lord and He answered you, Indeed, I will reinforce you with a thousand from the angels following one another. And of course, brothers and sisters, it's important to remember that angels are incredibly powerful beings. Jibra'il by himself, he flipped the villages of Sodom and Gomorrah by himself with one of his wings. A thousand angels, this is tremendous power that is being given to the Muslims. And then Allah speaks to those angels. In verse number 12 of Surah Al-An'am, إِذْ يُوحِي رَبُّكَ إِلَى الْمَلَائِكَةِ Remember when your Lord revealed when he inspired the angels anni ma'akum so allah says i am also with you i am also with the angels fathabbitu alladhina amanu sa'ulqi fi qulub alladhina kafaru ar-ru'b allah says to the angels i am with you 
So strengthen those who have believed. Fortify the hearts of the mu'mineen. Allah then says, I will cast terror in the hearts of those who disbelieved. I will make their hearts fill with, filled with fear. And when you're afraid, when you're panicking, you can't fight. You become completely paralyzed. Allah says to the angels, strike them upon the necks and strike from them every fingerprint. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that yes, even though what we see is that the Muslims are striking, but in fact it is the malaika, the angels are aiding the, the believers in their fight against the mushrikeen. And in the middle of the battle, as the battle is about to begin, you know, before the two armies clash, you know, after the Mubaraza, after Ali, Hamza, they they kill Utba, Shayba, and Al Walid, the Prophet sallallahu he he kneels down, he picks up some pebbles, and he throws it at he throws it in the direction of. Quraysh's army. And he says, Shahitul Wujuh, may these faces be cursed. And every single person in the army of Quraysh felt blinded by those pebbles that the Prophet threw, even though the Prophet was far away. And indeed, this is what this is one of the miracles of the day of Badr, that with those few pebbles, with that dirt and sand the Prophet was able to at least temporarily blind the mushrikeen. And this is where Allah mentions it in the Qur'an in Surah Al-An'am, verse 817, uh, verse 17, Surah number 8, وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى And it was not you, O Muhammad, who threw that handful of sand at the disbelievers, but it was God who did so. Allah Azza wa Jal. He paralyzed them. He, he blinded them through your hands. So after this, the two armies clash and the battle officially begins. And inshallah, in our next episode, we will, we will speak about the, uh, the fall of Abu Jahl and Umayyah ibn Khalaf and the aftermath of the battle of Badr. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for tuning in. I look forward to having you join me in our upcoming episodes of the life of Prophet Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Any questions or comments? Alaikum Shaykh. Alaikum assalam. This was very interesting. So at, at the end, when the Prophet's throwing these pebbles towards the kafar, it sounds very similar to the dust that was blown towards the kafar when the prophet was leaving his house to migrate to Medina. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's similar in the sense that it seemed to have a blinding effect. And of course, you know, in his uh, hijra, he uh, he was able to temporarily impair their sight, you know, through a miracle. And he was able to escape uh, from Mecca. Now, in this in this case, we don't. I mean, we don't know exactly what was what was the what was the exact impact, but definitely, it it, it paralyzed them. It visually paralyzed them for a bit, and uh, it definitely gave the Muslim army a tactical uh, advantage. So, so this, so the what what the Prophet did was, it seems that he temporarily disoriented the uh the mushrikeen and this is what what resulted in their complete obliteration uh and their their the, the heavy casualties that they uh they lost and, and in the dua that the prophet made to allah uh where the second half could you explain the second half where he says but if you wish not to be worshipped then you will not be worshipped so again the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, is basically highlighting that, oh Allah, the the natural consequence, and of course Allah knows, but the dua is more about talking and maintaining communication with Allah. 
So the Prophet is basically saying that if we are annihilated, the only Muslims in the world who are worshipping you as you wish to be worshipped is are these group of people, is this group. And if we're destroyed, you're not going to be worshipped. And if it is your will that you don't want to be worshipped, of course, because you don't need worship, then that's up to you. Essentially, what the Prophet is saying is that, Oh Allah, you do as you please. If we are killed, no one is going to, you, you will not be worshipped as, as you wish to be worshipped, in the way that you want to be worshipped. But if, if you have decreed that we are to be obliterated, then we submit to whatever your plan is. So this dua is really an expression of the Prophet's complete submission to Allah's will. That if we are killed, your deen is going to be you know, uh, vanquished. But if this, is, if this is your plan, then so be it. Yeah, thank you. And, and do we know why the Ansar were the ones who were sent forward first? So it so the Ansar, the 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 Banu Afra who came forward, it doesn't seem that they were I didn't find anything that mentions that the Prophet sent them. It seems that they they eagerly stepped forward. And of course the Prophet, you know, didn't want to turn them away. They were eager and but Utba uh rejected uh, their uh, their challenge because he wanted to fight their equals. So it seems that they they took it upon themselves to step forward. They wanted to demonstrate their eagerness to fight and defend the Prophet. Thank you. And now for the Battle of the Fall, uh, it seems like the Meccans, they were not really inclined to fight from the beginning. Yeah, uh, especially based on the last lecture. Uh, and so, why why did the prophet lead the Muslims to battle if even they were all Muslims were also not very keen to be fighting? So, if if you recall, the reason why the prophet has a significantly smaller number than Quraysh is because when when the prophet set out from Medina, the intention was never to have. A battle. They wanted to raid and confiscate the caravan of Abu Sufyan, which was guarded, which had 40 guards. And the Prophet and the Muslims figured that 313 is sufficient to overwhelm the caravan of Abu Sufyan. So basically, the idea was that we will surprise them with shock and awe. 313 descending on a caravan that's only being guarded by 40. But of course, Abu Sufyan takes a detour because he, he receives word that the Muslims are waiting to ambush. And then, of course, he sends Lam Lam al-Ghifari to, to, to basically fabricate a story that the Prophet attacked their caravan. So the Prophet was essentially caught by surprise. The Muslims were caught by surprise. So the initial operation was to ambush a caravan of 40 men. And that's why they uh, they set out of uh, uh, Medina. But when they're when the Quraysh catch up with them, thinking that Muhammad has ambushed their caravan, but they realize that the caravan is safe in uh, in Mecca. That Abu Sufyan sends word that we're safe. Now the armies are both facing each other, and you know there are people on both sides who try to. Uh, you know, take a, a, a diplomatic route, but uh, there's you have people like Abu Jahl and others whose presence, uh, you know, makes it very difficult for the uh, the Quraysh to turn back. And now, you know, the Muslims essentially have to fight because there are enough uh, men from Quraysh who want to have a military uh, confrontation.